Thank you all for showing up. I will make Molly pay. Um, it's, uh, uh, I was here four weeks ago for the mayor's uh, conference that we had, and we had a really good talk, so I'm really glad to be, be back in Gloucester. If I can make this work, we'll be, we'll be good. So um, uh, like I said, I've known Molly for 25 years. She will pay for not being here, uh, and I really uh, wished I had seen her talk. But the scary thing was the note I got from her. And again, this is someone who's known me for 25 years. And she says, hit that magic mix of cool science and be entertaining. Um, <laughs> it, it, yeah, OK, so there's a challenge there. 45 to 50 min max, um, that's easy. And, but my staff actually would like me to have one of these, because when I go, they would then zap me. And that would keep me under control. The enthusiastic follow-up, if I do 50 minutes, that may be more akin to the villagers burning down uh, Dr. Frankenstein's castle or something, because you'll, you'll have lost it at that point. Um, I think bringing this together with the context that we're in is, is we're all facing challenges on all sides. I've been at this for a little over 30 years. Um, I used to beg my way on boats in 1977. I didn't have to have insurance. We didn't have to have a lot of that. I never was rejected from a boat. Sometimes they made fun of me because I knew the scientific names, but I didn't know the common names. But in any case, we, we are at a, at a really difficult time. And how do we address these issues? So that's um, you know, what, what Molly sort of challenged to me was and how I was thinking about it. And meanwhile, she, she sends me a text message today and says, the weather's bad, and I'm not tagging. And it's OK, sorry, Molly. Uh, <laughs> We'll see how that goes. So I want to start sort of with a message from our sponsors. And I'm the director of the Cooperative Research Program. Someone sent me an email maybe a week or so ago um, where I think there was some uncertainty or lack of clarity as to what the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service and what our level of involvement is in cooperative research. So what I'll try and do is do two or three slides to give you a, a really high level program overview and reassure you that Cooperative research is something myself I've been doing for almost 30 years. I started in a shark tagging program. Uh, but our goals and objectives are actually characterized in mission statements. And the top two are sort of mom and apple pie. This is the goal. This is what came out of public hearings. Um, these are our touchstones. And for me, it means you know, us working together and solving problems. But if you're managing a, a research program, you need to have quantitative standards. And so we actually try to measure the things that we do and how they contribute to improving science. And you do things like, have you improved the confidence intervals? You know, are you getting better samples? And our focus on the hard science end of it is to really try to improve the stock assessments, fill gaps. You know, there are species that are exploited now that we do not have a lot of work. So we are the gap-filling gap -filling group. And what most of the talk will be about is to try and explain to you all and, and hopefully engage you in some discussions about how our understanding of the fisheries and the environment are, are constrained by the quality of the historical time series. In the middle of all this, you know, Molly says, well, John, remember, it's large pelagics. I said, well, Molly, remember, I haven't done large pelagics for 15 years. I did do them for about 20, 
but still, so I spent a bunch of time trying to find some old slides, and I'm hoping you're going to like some of those. But to get on to the cooperative research, we have the largest program in the country in most years by an order of magnitude. Close to $58 million have been spent in cooperative research since 1999. The cooperative sh shark tagging program based out of Narragansett, where I'm uh, housed right now, um, is, 50, is over 50 years old. It celebrated its 50-year anniversary last year. Um, over the last years, you can get on our website and you can find um, research projects and who are our external partners where you can find most of the reports as to what was done. In these major, these are our thematic areas, the areas that we believe that working with the commercial industry can help us use their skills to really focus and, and resolve issues and address some of these challenges. In the last series of reviews, because I get reviewed about every three years, every time anyone yells, they review us, because everybody pretty much likes cooperative research. Um, these were the, the highlighted areas were the ones that three years ago people said emphasize these. The underlined one is what we'll end with. So this is emerging. Directing cooperative research is like directing a ship. You can't change on a dime. Most of our projects are funded in one year. They take three years to be completion. A good size survey will be three to five years before you'll go through a peer review. <clears throat> and we've been successful in New England. It's one of the few areas where a broad communities agree with the fishery service. So I'm a target that's run out because people, A, I know a slew of them, and we do. We have a huge number of partners, and we have improved the science. Um, so that's the kind of the message from the, um, the, the, the sponsor. There's staff here with me, Earl and Carolyn, if you see them in town. I actually work for Carolyn. Uh, they, can, they can answer your questions. I could not do anything without the staff, and I've been blessed with the, the quality of the people that I've got. My field staff is second to none. We did 800 scientist sea days two years ago. So my response to Molly as I threw out this idea of capturing fishermen's local ecological knowledge, one of my uh, a, a friend who's, who you'll see I stole one of his slides, was talking to a fisherman. He said, I've got to get that model in your head. That's where you integrate this stuff. And he said, well, could you stand back five or six feet because you're getting a little scary. It's, it's how we view, uh, we view the world. But again, you know, we cannot do this. And it doesn't work if you just charter a boat and you have one conversation. Um, I'm now working myself with the grandsons of fishermen that I worked with when I started. You have to, if we're all in, we all got skin in the game, we got to stick it out. And a lot of this stuff isn't easy to do. The things that we're trying to understand about fish stocks, the fleets, and the environment are all dynamic. They all move. They all are highly variable. And what we understand about them and how we model them is basically going to be driven by the temporal, spatial scales of the data. And so that will be a, a difficult thing, possibly, but it's the source of a lot of misunderstanding about what we do. So I will try to talk a little bit about things that I did when I was much younger and lighter. And uh, then we'll talk about some of the things that we're doing right now and things that are emerging. And my goal, hopefully, is to talk about how we can work better together and, uh, and use new technology and broaden our reach, bring in more partners. Um, <clears throat> so for big fish, when I, when I started, we had IBM key punch cards. And I had to hand code using Loran charts where I would spend hours reading the fisherman's log and turning his Loran numbers into latitude and longitude. And to this day, these blocks that you see, those are five degree squares. The required international reporting for high seas fisheries for most of your international organizations are a five degree block. That's from Cape Hatteras to central New Jersey. Your Gulf of Maine is one five-degree block. The Japanese report 
fisheries high seas statistics and you're told the month, the five degree square, and then they'll tell you the number of efforts, sets, and the only other breakdown that you have is the number of hooks between floats. That's the only information and then you have the catch. You don't know anything more within that block than that there was effort somewhere in that huge geographical area. The numbers that you see there, um, I actually made up uh, 30, 20, 20 years ago. Those are the blocks that we use to combine data from Canada, Spain, Japan, and the United States. Every high seas long line trip, we know what five degree block it was in, what the species composition, and maybe four or five other codes. But beyond that, we don't know what happens within a trip, and we know very little about where that trip actually occurs. What you have to do is have a graduate student who's really hungry, and he, you lock him in the office like I was, and eventually you come up with a map where you've plotted those sampling locations. Um, I have a, a couple pictures. Uh, so in, in 1969, in terms of technology though, that upper map was from an interview that a fisherman gave a Sea Grant official. And he turned out a book that was distributed, a booklet on how to longline. Well, 1969 was the height of the swordfish fishery. It had grown, it, the longline industry had been introduced basically from sets that were lost at sea and floated for two days when that we were exploring for tunas. And um, he, he never actually liked that he, that he produced that because he said it gave away his, um, his, his uh, secrets. But in any case, even in 1969, fishermen were talking about water masses, direction of warm water, set your line here. Don't set this line. Um, I programmed his entire uh, logbook data set uh, as part of my dissertation, and I'm now working with his, one of his sons I worked with too, one was lost at sea, and the family seems to be genetically predisposed to trying to teach biologists things. At that point in time, I can remember witnessing an argument between oceanographers and this captain the oceanography community hadn't understood that there are warm core rings. And the fisherman is saying, I had tropical fish in Hudson Canyon. And the oceanographer says, that's impossible. The water doesn't move that way. And the fisherman said, I had tropical fish in Hudson Canyon. Your model's wrong. Okay. By 1987, I was down at the University of Miami. And we got to the state. And, I'm, and I apologize for that picture, but I got it. Um, actually, we don't have that except in this format. I do have photographs every five days for 1987. These are composites. And in those days, we didn't have the software to manipulate this stuff. So this was a project of doing this where we had a room probably about this side with tapes this big. And it took 14 months to process the data for one year to overlay it. And again, the question is, how do you work in an environment that's dynamic and it's moving on daily bases? How do the fishermen exploit that? How do the species separate there? Because we know they all can't live in the same space at the same time. And so this is the kind of local knowledge. I mean, I had to go and ask specific questions of the captains. How do you get a targeted tuna set in the middle of an area that, to me, people were using for swordfish. And when you looked at the records, they were distinct. They had different characteristics. The fisherman was understanding something about that environment at a scale that allowed him to focus. And I, I believe those were uh, yellowfin, yellowfin sets. The other thing I'll tell you is my, one of my, my first boss, he said, um, Every chance we got, we begged our way on boats. And he said, John, these guys throw overboard more biology in a day than you're going to study in your career. Get on the boat, ask questions, and try and understand what they're, what they're doing. And in many cases, and I'll talk about this a little later, 
Um, fishermen will make decisions within a trip that will focus and change. And these are driven by their markets. They're driven by their regulations. And that's the area we're, that we need to, to understand. Um, so to some extent, you know, it's that, that daily decision that we have not been able to track to understand how the environment is used and, and what is happening. Um, so we go back. Uh, this is stuff that I, of a lot of the older stuff, I actually recovered records and I realized I was programming data that was collected the day I was born. But I picked this slide out of a bunch of slides because these white sets up here, those were the original exploratory work for bluefin tuna in the Gulf of Maine on a, on a rigged schooner out of Gloucester. I forget the name right now, uh, but they basically um, used very old style gear to try and understand what the bluefin resource was. And we found these old, old records. And um, I managed to be able to get uh, a certain amount of data out. We got one location parameter. I got a few temperatures. And I got a date and a time. And then I basically got tuna. And we know most were tuna. And then sharks. And we know most were blue sharks because it's cold up there. And that's, that's what you have. But again, this is um, a lot of this work um, basically was us begging our way on boats. Uh, we have Canadian DFO sets. We had a lot of, of cooperation uh, with biologists up there. And um, over time, over the years, um, we started building these databases to help us with the international management. Now we'll come to the future. What can we do now? Now, on a daily basis, usually four times a day, you can get CWIFs, products which are measuring chlorophyll, at one kilometer resolution, the size of the block that they can give you the measurement for what's going on is one kilometer. The long line gears are 40 miles long in some cases. Um, you can get the, the SST composites. And this is the modern version of those old photos that I had. But now we can access this stuff um, real time. And one of my closing slides will show um, how we've used some of this. But you're dealing with us trying to understand changes in a dynamic environment over decade-long periods when we know about things like the North Atlantic Oscillation. And so we've got a lot of this old data that now we're trying um, to get it back so we can look at what happened in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s because it won't take 900 graduate students in a sweatshop to produce the work. Um, you can crank this stuff through. So here's uh, work uh, with a, 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 st a student who didn't want to go to school. He said, well, John, just get me a job. And I said, well, you really should go to school. I don't want now. Two days ago, he told me he wants to go for his PhD. He's got three kids. I said, boy, <laughs> whew, you're in for it, boy. Uh, but in any case, this is an entire uh, decades worth of observations from observers on board where we have more detailed data overlaid against a single uh, two-day day composite. So it, it shows the extent of the area that we're covering. So one of the take-home messages here is the scale on which we look at our fish stocks. When we work in the pelagic arena, these are ocean basin scale populations. When we work on a lot of our other stocks, you can have a genetically distinct unit of reproducing animals in the Gulf of Maine. I mean, the entire Gulf of Mexico was one block for me when I was doing swordfish stuff. When we do, when we do shrimp work, there are 21 zones in the same area. It's, we have to have the scale of our data appropriate for the population of the animal. And that's what fishermen know. A lot of the times, that's a challenge for us. Because what we know is the scale of the data that we've collected. And if it's been summarized at too high a level, it's hard to piece this stuff out. So I mean, the, the guy who did this stuff, he wrote some really cool code. Um, basically, what we're doing here is for each long line set, you have the begin set and the end set. The line's 40 miles long. I can collect 
connect them, assuming that there's a straight line. It drifts overnight, and I have the begin hall and the end hall. So we can turn every set for which I originally only have four temperature observations. I get those recorded at the beginning and end of each action. So I have four temperature observations. He turns it into a polygon and can zoom in, and at one kilometer resolution, he can give me mean, min, max, and standard deviation. What are the environmental characteristics that that gear swept to while it was being fished? Because again, if it's more variable and there's a greater range in temperature, I believe there may be a different species mix than if all my gear drifts through is between 58.4 and 58.9 degrees. I'm only going to get the animals that live in that zone. And this is how we're trying to understand the dynamics. And not only can we do, once we have where you are, and we can overlay it, this is all great because it's surface gear, but underneath this, there's a layer that can tell me what depth was it over. How far was it from a front? We can get upwelling, we can get downwelling, we can get chlorophyll A. We can try and understand the productivity and the things that are likely I am going to kill myself with this for sure. <laughs> That's the entertainment part, right? Yeah, OK. I get it. So, uh, so, it's so. Back pocket. Back Thank you. I won't kill myself then. That's good. Um, so this, this and, and this really killed me, because right after we got this going, then I switched jobs, because I do that so people will keep me working and not shoot me. Uh, and and we still haven't, haven't completely finished. I'd love to run 50 years of data through something like this. But when I start talking to the oceanographers, they realize that the computer stuff we need to do is more than I can afford. Uh, but this is, this is really dynamic information that we did not understand until commercial fishermen and mariners interacted with oceanographers and said, guys, there are things that are going on out there that you're not understanding the physics of or how it works. Because we know we have a warm pool of water that's spinning. And it's getting shallower. And that's when we see more turtles at the surface. And these are things that we didn't know and we couldn't measure with some of the data that we had. Um, I got I to gotta talk about tagging. <laughs> a, Molly's a, a, a tagger, and, and uh, I started in tagging. The, the uh, tagging program out of Narragansett, as I said, is 50 years old. When I started in 1978, uh, we had tagged 30,000 blue sharks between 62 and then, and we didn't have a single transatlantic recapture. Uh, in two years, we tagged 5,000 animals each year, and we also, the Magnus Act came into place. We started deploying observers on foreign boats we started getting a trickle of returns. Um, a postdoc or a, a doctoral candidate at University of Washington came and worked for me. And after 40 years, the first time the stock this data was used in a stock assessment was his dissertation. We had to completely redesign the database because we were tracking tags. And as it turns out, you have to ha track both tags and fish. And we had some sharks that would we caught and tagged, someone else caught and tagged. We had one that was seven times. That screws up our model. So those damn animals aren't you know, doing what we, what we want. Um, and then the technology here is another area. Molly's done a lot of work with satellite tags. Um, I'm the chairman of the National Cooperative Research Group, so I managed to steal slides from partners at our other science centers. And, and my, my first one story. Uh, that's animal with attitude. OK, we were probably about 130, 40 miles offshore. Uh, we have mako sharks in, the embry in, in embryonic mako sharks that are only three or four inches shorter than that. This is a young of the year animal. We were out on a, a very large survey cruise. Uh, the animal wasn't hooked. We were trying to pull the bait that was almost half its size. He came up in the water column, was dragged along the side of a 200-foot-long boat, and was not happy that we were trying to take. So we held on to it. We flipped him on deck. 
put a cloth, wet cloth over the, the eye, which calms them down. We, there's a cattle ear tag. You can't see it there. But for the small sharks, the cattle ear tags, we've had recoveries after 18 to 20 years. The dart tags can sometimes pull out. Um, did it very quick. Threw the animal over. It attacked the boat. <laughs> after we heard its teeth clanging against the side of the boat, it went back into the water and then took off through the tops of three waves. I personally believe if you're that mean, that young, OK, you're never going to be caught. And dealing with Makos, we dealt with a lot of them. Um, in the five years I was in graduate school, we looked at five animals over 1,000 pounds. One was a male. It was sexually mature. Five females, four females, over 1,000 pounds, sexually immature. Oh, boy. OK, that is a very difficult population of animals. We don't have physical gear in some cases that can capture these. And when we did the literature search, we worked with the Japanese fleets and the others. Most of the time when they get really big mako sharks, it's a combination of strange events. There'll be tail wraps, something else involved. Because the physical gears we have cannot stand up to animals with that type of, of power. So that's, um, that's my highly migratory side of the talk. And um, you know, if, if there are questions or you can hold them now, what I'm going to try and now talk about is some of these spatial scale issues. But we're going to talk about our, our fisheries and domestically what we're doing for ground fish management, squid, mackerel, butterfish. Um, one of the things, again, there have been a lot of meetings in Gloucester and people asking questions about surveys versus how fishermen report. And the thing that you need to understand is that the reports are structured differently. On the left, these are the statistical commercial fishery dependent reporting blocks that the fishermen identify. I fished in this box. And that's the basis. That's the grid size that we're, we're looking at. And then you, you can see they're larger than 10 minute squares, but they're still fairly large zones. The survey, the bottom trawl survey, is based on strata that are largely depth, latitude, and then to some cases, bottom topography. So there are characteristics of how those strata were designed that reflect some component of the environment, mostly depth. Okay, And the spots you see, those are where in the fall survey the Bigelow made toes. Every strata gets a minimum of two stations. We have to have two in each strata. And they're randomly picked. The idea behind this, it's a multi-species, large scale. We go from Cape Hatteras into the Gulf of Maine. We do stations in the Canadian zone. And we need a broad, statistically based sampling scheme. That's fundamentally different than what we do with the base landings data. So it's just, it's, it, it's a. Um, it's a point of concern and questions about our survey, but it's also something that, that there are, are differences that are important for people to, to understand. There isn't any scientist um, who wouldn't love to do twice that number of states. We, we like data. We're, we're kind of geeks like that. I mean, that's why they give us big computers. You know, We really do that. But there's a, a logistical in terms of how many stations you can do per day within a season to try and keep your survey consistent within years. And the ships, um, I think when the Bigelow goes out now, it's got a scientific crew of 18 to 19. So you're starting to deploy those type of resources. It's, it's a, very large, a very large investment. Um, over the years, probably the single largest investment cooperative research has made since 2000 has been in industry-based surveys. We use industry boats, not the white ships. We identify the stocks 
and the areas where the industry has concern or the stock assessment people say we really don't, you know, we need, we need more samples that we're not getting off of the standard federal survey. And these usually are specially designed. The industry boats are cheaper to run, um, but we can't do as much work on them. We, the, the largest crew size we generally have is we put uh, five scientists on, on board. So the amount that you can do um, is limited. And actually, I pushed that with the sweep survey. Kevin, you want to go on another sweep survey? Yeah, you do. Kevin's an animal, so he likes to do that. Three of the other guys told me, no way. We did 97 paired toes in nine days. And the crew was kind of, you know, you can only measure so much before you fall over. Right, Nick? Yeah. Yeah, that was a brutal one. But also, our partners have done this. And the other unique thing um, about the cooperative research program in the Northeast is we're the only place in the country, there are only two other smaller programs, where we have the research set aside. This is where a portion of the quota is taken off the top, and it's used to fund research. That is usually important to the Northeast region, but we have no financial federal dollars associated with it. We literally grant days at sea or pounds of fish. But for the scallop fishery, that's what about, or about 10 million $10 million worth of research each year is funded out of that quota calculation. And it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic program. So for monkfish, we ran special surveys. And surveys give you a snapshot in time. So if you're not going to do it for a long time series, you either then are doing it once to see, I'm going to do it this year and see how it compares to my stock assessment number. Am I close? In the case of monkfish, we were doing it every three or four years, and then we can make those jumps because the animals live long enough and you can do it. But the density of samples along the edge of the continental shelf during the winter months when these surveys were run is much higher than our traditional way of approaching it. So again, this is a way of doing, working with industry. Um, we bring the captains in. And so for a while, the negotiation was, well, we want to pick stations. Well, how are you picking the stations, Cap? And he couldn't tell us. So then we said, well, then we don't know how to analyze it. Uh, we have to understand how you do that. We got to a point where what we asked them was, what are the strata that you think are undersampled? And then we put random stations in there. And, and that, again, um, the fishermen supported. But we did a lot of sampling. Um, and that then also gives you the opportunity to get better numbers of biological samples to look at age, growth, reproduction. So if our, our normal survey may only get two or 300 of those animals in a year, we can run one of these surveys and get a much larger sample and be more confident that we know um, what's, what's going on with the animals in terms of their uh, reproductive patterns, age, and growth. And all of that information is related to the things that you'll hear about biological reference points. Those are the things that determine the productivity of stocks. Are we taking too much? Are we taking too little? And we have to know how those change over time. And a lot of the other work that we're doing is, is vulnerable to things when we don't have enough repetitive samples over time. You would expect populations to change as they age. Um, the math behind it is hairy, but it's pretty clear. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, capturing the model inside the fisherman's head. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is really what I love. Uh, it, it's an idea of how we can work with the fishermen to gather more information from them at, at the fine scale at which they work while at the same time, the reason it was suggested, it was suggested by fishermen because they said, we don't like that paper. Those paper reporting forms don't work for us. We think you guys are missing something. So the schema here is we'll put laptops on your boat. Um, we'll put temperature probes on your gear. We know where you are because you've got GPS. Um, then instead of having people hand code stuff, I keep them chained in while they're merging all these giant electronic databases. Tim, you like that? Uh, and, and when we need to, the communications can actually go through the VMS satellites. So in theory and in practice, 
we can receive data from C and we can know what you're doing. But I don't, I don't need that as a researcher now. Our management program yet hasn't done it. So you come into port and instead of transmitting something through the VMS that would cost you $12, your boat can pick up Wi-Fi there. We've now modified it so you can send that data. The point is, if you land at noon today, I can see your trip record. I can't see it. Brian can see it. I make him run the, run the programs. Um, we can see that data within two hours. The faster we see it, the faster we can support the fishermen to look at it, the quicker we can identify and make sure bad data doesn't get into the databases and then come back and four months later someone says, we have to correct this. And it, doesn't, it, it just doesn't work that way. Okay, so that's a new one. Oh, Apple. Oh, man. The habitat model may not run here. Oh, nuts. Anyway, we, we don't use, we're, the government doesn't let us use apples, even though half the analysts want them, but that's a different story. Uh, so this is an example of the, the actual paper form. So you tell them your gear. What was your stat area? Okay. Um, some information, fish one net, five and a half inch mesh, 50 foot head rope. The fisherman is saying, I made 15 three hour tows. If this wasn't an apple, you could see the boat track. There's a cluster of sets here. He moves, makes sets here, comes down here. We have another cluster, another cluster. On the way back, he hits one more spot there, and then he's in. Is that one fishing trip? Or is he exploiting different environments in four different clusters because he has trip limits and targets for six different species? So he goes out, and he gets his cod here. He makes a run out here, and he makes five toes to get haddock, moves, moves over, picked up something here, and then knew he had some allowed level of something else on the way in. My contention is that these are more closely similar that, to themselves than these are. And these are, these are the decisions that we need to understand if I'm going to actually know what did this fisherman catch where, how are the species separated. This is their local ecological knowledge that you can watch on the way we track these things. You can watch the trip evolve. You can see what they're doing. And so the richness and texture of what we're understanding now is, is improved. We're understanding more and have the capacity to understand what's going on. And then how we estimate for those boats that, that do not have observers on board, you know, we need to understand how these things are occurring when we assign what we're going to assign to them based on observer coverage. And again, it's this matter of scale. How quickly can you get the data? How quickly can you do these matches with, se with several databases? Right. Uh, well, in, in essence, what the f yeah, and and so I guess the point really is that the fisherman's log record now, he he su he summed everything. Literally, all we'll get is we'll get um, under this blacked out column, um, he'll have his catch by species. Um, every federally permitted boat uh, that has uh, federal permits in any of the managed f uh, fisheries from Portland, Maine, wherever our area of responsibility is for the Northeast Science Center. So we have responsibility for all fisheries, basically from a little bit south of North Carolina. There are a couple overlapping stocks that we share responsibility with for, uh, with the Southeast Science Center. HMS species are different. Um, those are the responsibility of a headquarters office, but we still support some of the management um, and monit monitoring issues. Yeah, 
If, um, well, I, I believe I've got, we have four, I think we have four boats wired up here in Gloucester. I'd love to have them all. Um, but it's a given, it's a given, it's a given, to, you can't give me enough data. As long as you live, you're never going to do that, and people who know me will, will, will attest to that. Is Right. And, but and, research, you can right. And that's actually the driver when the fishermen suggested this program, because they said, well, we know what you're trying to compare it to, and you're trying to compare it to the observer data. And the observer data is toe by toe. And the fishermen who were involved then were worried about us missing just that pattern. I got my cod here, I got my pollock here. You guys need to use smaller zones um, to, to combine this stuff. So, um, so we have our software system, Sim relatively simple laptop. Um, it can work in two modes. We developed it to do toe by toe for direct comparison, but you can also use it to fill out that sub-trip paper. The benefit of doing it that way is everything's programmed in. We program the laptop for the vessel and the operator. His operator permits are in there. His boat information is in there. Um, if you start moving paper and fishermen are writing on paper at sea and a third party is key punching it, um, no one could key punch any record I wrote. Um, my uncle actually returned a Christmas card one year saying, could someone interpret this? His handwriting is uh, horrific. Um, you just, you, there, there are so many opportunities for an error that we can eliminate by having the software tuned to the boat and the people. So there, there's limited effort and he can't make mistakes. What we want the fishermen to do is to enter the kept and discard. Cap I can handle the rest if you work with my field staff and get your logbook set up right. Name your nets we put, and tell us what fishery you use them in, and we have short lists that remind them. When they use the laptop, if they make mistakes, there are eight or nine what, what we would call um, catastrophic errors that we know will, will mean we can't link tables up. So the software makes sure that there aren't errors in those. When you send the, tr the trip to us, our load routine does another 22 or 23 checks. The fisherman gets a note back that says, you know, check this. Was it 10,000 pounds of dogfish on this tow or 100,000? Even hitting a laptop at sea when things are rolling around, you can add a few zeros. The idea is to get that out and don't let that error creep into a, a database. <clears throat> and we have the, on the trawl doors, we now use a, a temperature depth probe. We swap them out every 30 days. They record the temperature and depth they're on continuously at 90 second intervals. When they turn the laptop on, it's recording where they are, again, every 90 seconds. I, I chain a guy up into an office and he lines up the databases until his eyes cross, but in essence, um, we can line up the temperature and depth. We can plot exactly where the effort occurred. And we can distinguish between trips that work one set of grounds, repetitively towing over one area, versus trips that we would call disaggregated. They're in, they're in different places. They're working the grounds. Um, those are old numbers. I've got, uh, yeah, because I stole this from another presentation. Um, this is, I think, through 2010, uh, we have 30, 30 boats currently wired up. Um, the fishermen helped us design the software. Uh, Phil, uh, Phil Rule told me, John, I'm never going to let you go off and design a laptop program for me because I know I'll never be able to make it work. And they've suggested that how the screens would look and how they would flow so that it fits their operation and they can un understand it. A lot of it is also helpful because it's hard to make a mistake in interpreting how you should fill something out because you just have to hit buttons. The fishermen quite often have had trouble understanding the regulations with the reporting. Do I report each area? And it's, it's, it's not necessarily 
easy. Um, Yes. Yes. The, so when, if you do the toe by toe now, we've written the software. And if the captain wants that data submitted as a VTR, um, we, we run the routines that do that. Um, the toe by toe data is a research science data set. It's in, inside a firewall. And there are very strict data confidentiality requirements. And in fact, I, I couldn't send toe-by-toe -toe data to the regional office because the design of their tables uh, would crash if I, if I did that. So we can sum those up and move, move along. So the other thing we want to do is we want to give the data back to the fisherman. Like I said, the fisherman can get on a secure website, use his password. Um, he can then get his species composition on any single toe, temperature, depth, We've now processed um, 2.7 million 90-second bottom temperature and depth records um, and turned 2.1 million observations of temperature over to the oceanographers to try and help us model bottom temperatures. And I have a slide on that. And again, this is this idea now, because of that um, temperature depth probe, we can accurately measure when his trawl was on the ground. If you're doing catch per unit effort and effort is overestimated, you've got an imprecise, imprecise measure. So we can work through that. And this is, this is where we are on the left. That's the total for, uh, of locations of observer trips the last several years. And on the right is what we've gotten out of our study fleet boats. So I think we're reasonably representative. We need, we need some more boats that work out here. Um, we probably could use some more on Georgia's. But the only area you see a real hull is off of Long Island and down. And again, we, we have most of our boats are out of Point Judith. And they're not fishing in those grounds. But the capacity exists. And these are the numbers. So already, and I think this summary was as of uh, April 2nd. I already have access to over 400 trips in our software where we can see what their catch rates are and what's going on. Uh, but again, when we use this as um, stock assessment tools, the currency of the realm is time series and data density. Uh, that looks like a lot of data, OK? But that's over multiple years at a very large scale. If we zoom in and I take you to the month, 10 minute square, which is roughly 700 square kilometers or something. I forget what the conversion. It depends on where you are latitude wise. But that's still a large block for a fisherman to exploit. Uh, between 55 and 73% of the data is confidential. So when you zoom in, you, you lose uh, data density. So here's an area where we have a large number of boats out of Point Judith. So in a number of years, um, we have very uh, large numbers of our self-reported toe-by-toe data that we can now directly compare to the observer data to evaluate how good are our guys doing at estimating discards, how good do the things line up, but we also get the bottom temperatures. We get this understanding of what they're catching and where they're catching it. And, and this is what we can release and what we can distribute. This is a surface contour plot, an interpolated model. It looks at the distances between all the points and averages it out. It's, it's if you're in a hiker and you get uh, elevation maps for trails, this is the same kind of thing. We can release these products because there's no way for anyone to identify a single fisherman's activities. And what we did was we worked with a bunch of guys down out of Point Judith. And at that point in time, uh, winter flounder was a prohibited species. And the guys wanted to avoid them. But they're operating in a summer fishery for squid and scup. And in 2009, the, as fishermen would say, the squid were tight on the beach. OK, that year, they, we had really good squid fishing right along the beach. We had another cluster just, just uh, to the west of, of Block Island. And the winter flounder were separate and distinct. 
When we did this, we had three, we did this for each, each year is the average of June, July, and August. And then we took this down and talked to the fishermen. Does this, does this look right? And 09 stood out because they all said the, the squid were very close to the beach. In 10, we had a different model. So we are capturing the right thing. When you see things drawn out like this, these are artifacts of the, of the interpolation. We have something called a sill, sill depth. You, you set how far you look um, for this kind of thing. Uh, so again, this is uh, some of the products that we're trying to work on so that we get, then distribute these through what we call our avoidance network, which are programs that are trying to make this information available to fishermen near real time so they can look historically at what the patterns were. Then I can look at what happened to me now. Do I move west? Do I move east? What do I do to avoid these types of problems? Um, this is the same thing, except we didn't use animal catches. We used the bottom temperatures. I, I knew I was close because I had May, June, July, and August for 9, 10, and 11. And I took all the paper, and I went down. And I'm a dock rat. So I, I got on a boat of one of the study fleet guys, and he called a bunch of other captains. And I got trampled as they took the papers, and they spread it out. And they, they were saying, this is how do we get more of this. This is the thing that the fishermen, most of the smaller boats, can't see near real time what their bottom temperatures are. If you're running a really big boat and you have an ITI system or one of the others, they're 40 or 50 grand, you can have net sensors that would do that. But most of the guys can't afford that. Uh, but this is the kind of thing, again, if we can give you uh, contour plots of various species, and then show you in certain years what the temperatures are, you have more strategic information to make decisions about where to fish and when to fish. Um, and so this was a, um, we sent a, um, a bid out, this was 10, um, a, a bid where we, we wrote the specs and we said we want a wireless temperature depth probe and we're seeking bids from electronics companies I think we got seven bids. Uh, the, the actual Aquatech that won the contract is an English company. Uh, we got 10 prototypes. We have five that are out on uh, lobster boats. We, we broke one and we had to send that back. And we got the other four. But in essence, we attach this to the trawl door. The trawl door breaks the surface of the water. It listens for the laptop. As long as there aren't any nasty red X's that show up here, the fisherman hits the button. This is the temperature and depth profile for the tow he just completed. This closes the loop of me now letting him know exactly what he fished in so that he can then look at those other, other maps. Again, can we help you avoid or focus because we now have total allowable catches. We don't have some of the other, other issues. And so these are the new partners. So um, about two years ago, in a meeting, I talked to some oceanographers, and they said, how many bottom temperature observations do you have? Between Martha's Vineyard and Cape Hatteras, I think there are only nine more to raise, which continuously, through satellites, feed bot measured bottom temperatures to the oceanographic community to, for them to inform their models. Other than that, the only data they have are when they set out um, their glider fleet, which are underwater submersibles that can glide through the, the water, uh, collecting a lot of information. Or they, they are the archive for all the federal and state and university oceanographic missions that monitor these things. The oceanographic community is much better than biologists at sharing data. And the biologists need to learn from that. We're really, we're, we hoard stuff. We don't like to share. We're afraid we're going to publish. Then we find out we've collected more data than 16 people could ever, could ever deal with. So we've gotten involved with people. And what started out as a working group of 12 um, is now merged into a working group of 25. And so the, the, what we're doing now is we know from our own surveys, again, these are survey stations, the, Twice the distance between our stations is what you'd call your kind of your pixel size. Our stations are roughly nine kilometers or so apart. 
So the granularity of what our survey tells us about ha the habitat of the animal is about 22 kilometers, still too large to be informative for a commercial fisherman. We're then going to overlay it with the observations from all the moored arrays and the transects. Um, there's 18 high frequency radar towers, 13 were knocked out by Sandy, but they basically give us wave height, wind directions, upwelling, downwelling. And these boys can punch this stuff through very quickly and run four or five models a day. So we use that information, we use general linear models and a bunch of other things for a variety of species, and we try to predict where are these animals? How well does it match up? You know, in theory, this animal is tightly bound. Uh, John, John refers to it as the tyranny of temperature. You're cold-blooded. Your metabolism, everything that you do is tied to temperature, and that's very controlling. This environment is very different than the terrestrial environment. I think there's only two more slides. <laughs> I hope this works. Yes. So, so when no one was looking because of the expense of the equipment we had, uh, we, we took an underwater glider and we strapped it to the, to the roof of the cabin on the, uh, on the Karen Elizabeth. And um, one of our guys went on, we, we, he, he sometimes goes on what's a walkabout, so he doesn't tell his boss where he is. And he radios, and he's on George's bank. We go, oh, crap, man, do I have insurance? You know, what's going on? Uh, but we basically strapped the glider to the wheelhouse roof. And four times a day, we beamed him what the oceanographic model said. And when we left the dock, the agreement was we were going to ask him, and he was going to sample in a poor spot and a, and a, and a good spot on our model. So, Chris, ha he's, he's patient to a point, and, and then you realize, we better do what Chris wants. Um, and he got about two days out there, and he said, OK, silly scientist. Um, you get your two shots, and then I'm going to pick a spot. So we, we and, and the model was, was, was doing reasonable. When we said it was low, you know, we get under 100 pounds. When we said it was good, you know, we get 1,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds. And then I get a picture of the, of the, and he says, and this is Chris's spot, and he was standing in 10,000 pounds because there were details. And, the, and again, our, our grain size was that 20-kilometer block. This fisherman with his scopes and things is real, really focused. And he, and he found and he taught us, taught us some things. First of all, um, some of the places he took us were just outside the edge of our survey. He understood what was going on in that environment, but we didn't have the, the observation records to understand that at all. Um, and so we're trying to look at these fine scales. So the, uh, they're trying to put in, I've, I've nicknamed it uh, glider in a box. Um, the glider is hugely expensive, but a lot of the electronics are really not. And what we're trying to see is if we can get an advanced technology award that will allow us to get about 25 or 30 of these communication boxes. So we basically would put um, a box on, on the roof of the boat, and it could communicate and receive the data, because that way we can pull every day the bottom temperatures off those wireless probes. Um, this type of information drives your oceanographic models. This is the type of information that said Storm Sandy was going to hang a left. Most of my fleet, most of my guys who were hiding from it, thought that was going to hit Narragansett Bay. And it was the difference between surface temperatures and bottom temperatures that drive, it's the heat energy that drives it. So the implications and the contribution the fishing industry can make is, is huge in these areas. And the oceanographic community is starting to get it. The other thing we did with this boat is we sent a glider out after it. So he was fishing, and we were trying to find it uh, with a glider to get these measures. Um, it's, it's, that's, the, that's the intellectual fun 
part of this stuff. We're pushing and we're doing things that I dreamed of doing in 1978, but we had no capacity to do it. When we used to give the fishermen the maps, you know, we'd get the daily download. It was black and white of what he is going to know more about the water, how it's moving, and where the fish are than anybody else, because it's those patterns within the trip, one set to another. They're looking at their data. That part of the gear caught something I don't want to catch. Was it too warm? They make those strategic decisions, and they're fishing on these mobile edges. Their understanding the ecology, the habitat, and the animals at a scale that ultimately we believe if we can start tracking, we can use this information to improve our stock assessments and our management of these resources. Hope you have a sun, sunrise 600 miles offshore. Beautiful day. Thank you. Okay, so we say Molly. Hey, Molly, went a little over. <laughs> She's selfish tagging. Jesus. Okay, so just feel free to walk out and uh, Are you going to have um, sonar equipment? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, um, we've got a, the end of the year, I, we've got a 13,000 acoustic. $13,000 acoustic recording system we put on a commercial fishing boat. Um, to use acoustics, you have to know something about the, the strength of the return and which frequencies um, are measuring the biomass and density of the species. And a lot of it's related to the um, swim bladder, because um, what you're actually measuring is that air pocket inside. And different species are detectable at different frequencies. So Carol and I were at a meeting in, in, um, in Point Judith, and we spent an hour on this discussion point. What the guys will tell you is, if they're looking for butterfish or squid, um, at a certain frequencies, they, they can't see anything, or it just looks like snow. And then when they change that frequency, the color will change, and they'll get the density measurement. And the trick in that area of, of, of the work is to get validation of what that species is, and then get uh, enough observations of what the strength of the backscatter is at, pardon me, at different densities of fish, so you can work out the math to convert an acoustic signal, or, or a, what's holding it up is the math. Well, what's holding it up is doing enough of the experiments for enough of the species, so that we can validate those things, and they they tend to work. Um, the, very, very well for the schooling semi-pelagics. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult when you've got animals that are really tied tight to the bottom, bury in the mud, and, and things like that. So it's very good. It's used to herrings and mackerel. Um, butterfish and squid we're, we're trying to, to work on. So that, again, that's cutting edge. That's, um, again, we need to think of new tools and new ways and easier ways for the fishermen to give us better data that, and again, you know, uh, some of my friends, uh, you know, told, they really didn't like the laptop at first, you know, but I'm persistent and um, I've known a bunch of them for a long time. But it, so it's, it's a lot to ask for, for some of the guys. Uh, but what I found is that fishermen by their nature are, uh, are fairly competitive. So, uh, but he was giving me a hard time, and again, like a little, bit, little, little bit. And again, some of these families I've known for a, a long time. I'm like their crazy uncle, you know. And uh, so he challenged me at one of the research steering committee meetings. He says, "Hey, John, your laptop." I said, "Well, Cap, you know, how come it always works when your son's on board and you're not?" He just leaned into the mic. He goes, "Well, Cap, we'll figure out how that works now, won't we?" <laughs> Never had another error. He, he was going to beat his son, and that's genetic in that family. They, they had that way. But again, they came back to us and said, 
uh, because we can look at how you use the laptop and we can detect, we try to meet the boats when we deploy the laptops the first five or six trips. We get the data off really quick and we look at it to make sure we did our training and we did our setup correctly and answer his questions as to how to, how to use it. The biggest problem we're finding right now actually is they forget to turn it on. So I can measure efforts with the temperature depth probe and then you know, he's, he's made his first set, the bag hits, he's got the gear out and he goes, crap, I forgot to turn it on. And then he turns it on and um, you know, so we actually had 70% of the trips, 17,000 toes had no problems. Um, then there were a variety of issues with the remaining 30%, but we only think about five to eight were the result of catastrophic failures. Basically, where something went wrong with the probe, uh, the GPS pole, uh, if we split the signal too much, the computer can't pick it up. And we've actually, I think, only had two or three in the eight or nine years we've been doing this, we've only had two laptops, I think, that, uh, that had system failures. One, actually, I think the one that froze out in, in Chatham over the winter, that actually came back and didn't fail after that. Cold is easier for laptops to handle than, than hot. And um, they're not expensive laptops. We tried. We had a bunch of things that we now use to prop open doors because they couldn't take. It's not so much the rocking at sea that we think sets off the electronics. It's the yaw. So um, whatever happens, we, we've had pretty good performance for reasonably priced laptops. Yep, yep. Of, of an area. Uh, on the other, then you have the fishermen going out and fishing where they want to fish. Yep. Uh, and they, they, they pretty much know. They, they have a pretty good idea where they want to go. Right. And they're fishing on a, you're getting your data there on a very fine scale, both in time, space. Right. And it, it, with, the, with, this type of, with this type of tool, we, we can do that, yes. They do, they're, you're, you're using them in different parts of the model. And um, again, the Bigelow survey is designed to be a very large, long-term, multi-species um, survey tool. The, you, that's used usually in the modeling system. That's treated independent as an independent measure of very large trends, and it's designed to tell us what happens over longer periods of time, over more species. Do you think it does, if the Bigelow could, could, could miss everything by two miles? Um, the Bigelow could do that, uh, but in the law of averages in sampling, that you would pick that up, chances are, the next, the next season. I mean, the... the uh. Okay, and again, that's what, that's what we're modeling for that part of the, of the program. And, and again, the state surveys, the surveys that the fishermen love the most, do the same thing. The NEMAP survey that runs along the coast, Maine, New Hampshire. Uh, the benefit that those have is they have a smaller area to cover, but we still have the strata the same way. The stations are still random. They get more of the density. So the probability of you um, and, and it does exist because, uh, and not so much in the Gulf of Maine, because as you saw, those strata um, are not as, you'd worry more about a really long strata where just by random draw one year, your two or three stations in that strata ended up being clustered. The, the, again, but 
the design of that survey when it was started 40 or 50 years ago was to give us these really long decadal, decadal trends. I mean, it's, it's a lot. Um, the science and the programs that we established, I, I dealt with this. Um, I was the head of statistics in the, in the headquarters for eight years. And um, this is the same thing with the Marine Recreational Fishing Survey. We designed it. Um, it passed every peer review, but it was designed to do something now that wouldn't support the level of detail of management and timeliness that we want now. So you have something that gives you reliable indices of order of magnitude region catches. The Gulf of Maine head boat catch of cod. On an annual basis, it's OK. And then we want to use it for wave, two-week time period adjustments. And it's a, again, it's a measure of your design and your sampling intensity has to match the question and the timeliness of the question that you want. And again, learning from the oceanographers, um, they're looking at things that are, that are the, the physics, water density, water masses, yet highly churned up, you know, moving at a much faster scale than the reproductive biological change of many of the stocks that we have. And again, um, depending upon which science center you are, how many surveys that they have, Highly migratory is 20, 20 years. We did nothing but use commercial. We, no, no one could afford, I would love if they would try, because I leave this job in a, in a heartbeat. Um, if someone said, John, design a high seas long line survey, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be beautiful. Okay? <laughs> I'd be in the Azores uh, uh, two weeks after Thanksgiving, because that would be the choke point for the larger offshore movement of recruiting blue shark, swordfish, big eye, and yellowfin as the, as the Labrador currents and things are. I mean, you can design things to do that. A lot of times now, based on the understanding we have of how fleets and groups of fishermen move. So the high seas work that we did, um, what you do is you, you replace the random sampling with groups of fishermen that you track over time. And um, there's actually a term in the literature called metiers. Um, they're sometimes called, um, I, I call them project or, or uh, uh, affinity groups. Um, how do fishermen learn? Okay, I, I get all these landings. We were processing landing trip reports. And what I noticed was the three brothers and their father fishing out of the same port had remarkably similar species composition and size composition. And they wouldn't share any of their information with anybody else. So once I knew who was related to who, who had first learned to fish by being crew on this boat, what were those relationships within the community, and then how does that community learn? We, br we brought together fishermen who had only fished out of one port with fishermen in the Gulf of Mexico that taught them how to avoid billfish because the guys down south had more experience and exposure to that. So, so it's the diversity of the tools you have and your understanding. But you can track, and what we're actually trying to do now is I'd like to track and take my boats out of southern New England. I know, and I can standardize their toes because now I have their catch. We know that's pretty good. It can be validated against the dealer. And I can get very clean effort by processing their data. And I don't have to worry about the guy saying, I made 15 toes that averaged three hours. That's the tyranny of the averages. He never fished for three hours. And he didn't get the cumulative. He didn't fish that hard. I can guarantee you that. So we'll know exactly what effort was. Linear miles towed. If I know the size of his net and I can standardize that, what I'm wondering is, how different is it going to be for the Bigelow? And what we found is when you look at the variability that's out there, it, it, it may not be as far off as we, as we need. That's why linking them together model-wise and tracking groups of fishermen together, you can standardize one against the other. And you, get, you, you have to take out 
to be left with the animal abundance, you have to standardize out the local ecological knowledge of the fisherman. That's time, that's depth, that's the rig of his gear. And I can code all those. And when I pull those out, the signal that's left is, is usually the pop, what we call the population signal. Where do most of your boats, your, your kind of fishermen come from? Uh, where, I, where, I mean, the laptop guys. The laptop guys, I, got, I think I got two or three in Maine, four here. I got Point Judith, I got eight, eight boats in New Bedford. Um, and we're working with uh, a number of organizations to try and get 115 laptops put out in the mid-Atlantic in the next th three months, four months. Um, no, that will, will have, uh, the estimate I got was we wanna, they wanna wire up 50 of the big offshore clam boats, 24 scallopers, 15 gill netters. I've got herring, mackerel, butterfish, squid, large freezer boats, I've got eight or nine of those. Um, again, the, we're trying to do two things with this. I don't wanna just, um, for this part of it where we're gonna try and debug what I'd call the pipes to move the data, um, to understand the environment, it doesn't help me if all my boats are in one tiny area. You, you need zeros in your observation sometimes to know where the fish aren't. And if we can get, and as the, oceanographers tell me the driver on the shelf that controls our environment on the shelf is the shelf slope front and the edge of the continental shelf. That's why the Pioneer Array and all the, the big oceanography community want to sample. It wasn't random choice that those people picked between Hudson and Block. It's considered one of the most variable and dynamic oceanographic habitats in the world. The largest range in mean temperature of any place in the world is the mid-Atlantic southern New England bite. Oceanographically, if you get those big global models, that is the area where it, that is the most dynamic. And that's the heart of where we're, what we're trying to look at. It's also still a big challenge to get fishermen who, who are willing yeah. to give us data on that scale. We run uh, competitions for the last five years, and we beat the bushes to get fishermen to come out and to sign up for our program, and they're really hesitant to give us that level of information. So it's something that has to evolve over time, you know, as, as we develop the, the The slides, you know, again, when I, so I was in um, Cape May, Barnegat, Montauk in just the last two or three weeks. And until you know, we, we explained to them the data controls, um, until we actually showed them the access contracts, and my, the Josh down in Rutgers said, John, I don't mind signing an 18-page federal thing that says I'm getting confidential data but could you at least remove eight of the references that say I'm going to prison? Because you've already got another eight. And this is, this is something that we're no longer gonna play around with. Um, some of our data was distributed inappropriately. It was displayed at a public meeting in a fishery where people sitting in the audience knew what was going on. That violates the law, people will go to prison. There are three, people at the Science Center who have the potential to go to prison if that happens. I'm one of them, and I'm not going, okay? So they're not gonna get the data. And if the captain doesn't approve, it doesn't go any place. He knows what I'm using it for, and he's approved what I've done with it. But it doesn't go any place until he tells me we'll, we'll allow that to be released. And that's, again, they have information that they're required to report so when we sum it up, the sum summaries can go. They don't, mind, they don't mind that, and that's why so many in the Mid-Atlantic now are interested in it, because they don't want to find themselves, to some extent, where we are up here, because if they make paper mistakes, you're in a sector system, and the fundamental premise there is that fishermen can trade. Well, if your paper gets returned, because there's a typo, there's an error like that, and they get too many errors, it, it limits their ability to trade, which undermines 
what are the theoretical supports for, for, do, for doing that? We want to make sure we can get your data quicker, we can let you look at it, and you can fix it quick. If I get back to you five months later and say, geez, you know, trip number 34, we don't know what you did. You can't, I mean, I don't remember what my last speech was last week. You know, someone comes to me and says, you know, you make 38, 40 trips a year, and, and we found three errors. Fix it. You know, we, we can take your data, we can give you the software to capture the information at sea. Then you, you tell us it's right. You get a chance to go in there, you can certify it, you can help us correct it. Now, I'm going to find errors in it. I can guarantee you, but I'm doing it analytically and we're looking at things and, and then we can go back, but we keep those things separate. There's a legal side of this, very much locked up, we're not releasing it. And that, that's, the, that's the gap that we have to get over. There's hesitancy that their information would go out. There's hesitancy that law enforcement can, re there hasn't been a single law enforcement, I mean, those guys aren't going to be going through and hunting randomly through databases. You know, it's, it's just not what we're, we all have to understand better what we're doing, how we're trying to solve these problems. And again, a lot of it is trust. You know, some of these guys, you know, a bunch of us have known them. Our field staff make 10, 15 days trips a year with them. Um, a bunch of the guys are now doing stomach sampling for us. I didn't even know, you guys slipped that in on me. I didn't even know about that. They, they were doing stomach sampling of, of the cod to verify this whole idea about whether they're feeding on sand lance or other things. So it's really cool when you really want to work together and solve it. <laughs> I think I don't want to keep marinating and the staff here waiting too long because they have to close at some point. But uh, <laughs> feel free to stay after and uh, talk to John. Uh, but uh, let's just thank John again. <laughs>